I want to pay my respects to the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation on whose lands we are meeting. We've been called cheats in cricket and we've dumped the Commonwealth Games. Is our international sporting reputation in tatters? And was Big W right to pull a sex book for teens from its shelves? On the panel tonight, Indigenous filmmaker Rachel Perkins, who recently won a NAIDOC award. British Armed Forces Minister James Heapy, who's in Australia for defence talks about AUKUS. Assistant Minister to the Prime Minister and for the Public Service, Patrick Gorman. An independent member for Curtin, Kate Cheney, who is working on the WA Yes campaign for the Voice to Parliament. And former Deputy Prime Minister Barnaby Joyce, a Nationals member for New England. And with US Republicans stalling AUKUS, is the deal in doubt? Carvelis, it's terrific to be back with you after a brief mid-year break. Remember, you can stream us around the country on iView and all the socials. Quanda is the hashtag. Please get involved. To get us started tonight, here's a question from Joy Kingston. Yes, um, I was wondering, um, with this recent pushback against cricket etiquette, craziness, and the Commonwealth Games signal the end of conquerors deciding Australia's future... Or will we, as Australians, feel unable to change our future because of the weight of the conqueror's legacy of high inflation and unaffordable housing? James. Heapy. Well, there you go. Conqueror's uh, legacy and all sorts of um, well, a loaded lot, topics there yeah, for a you lot, to take a lot on. Of that question. Uh, so, the cricket, uh, I have been crying all day that the, <laughs> uh, that the sun did not shine in Manchester when we needed it most. Uh, I'm not quite sure what uh, our legacy is over the Commonwealth Games. I mean, I, um, it's a great shame that, for whatever reason, Victoria has decided not to, to host them. The Games in Birmingham and uh, Gold Coast, I think, were regarded as a, as a success, but that's very much, it's very much your choice. Um, but I, I, mean, I, I, I reflect on a relationship between the UK and Australia that is... Uh, yes, rivalrous, but always uh, one that is based on deep and abiding friendship. And the purpose of my visit to your country and this part of the world this week is because there's a challenge to our shared values. Uh, and whatever there is in our past that may or may not, Rachel, cause you some concern, there is a lot in our future about which we must stand together and I'm confident that our countries will do so. Mm, it's, it's an interesting point about the past, but just returning to the Commonwealth Games theme, you say whatever the reasons are, the reasons are cost, and I suppose a view that perhaps the Games are declining in, in their, the way that people view them. Do you acknowledge that the cost is a huge issue and, well, if they're a good idea, perhaps the UK could pay for them? Uh, well, I, I, the, bit I'm not, the bit I'm not tracking is that what the, when we hosted them, they were a good thing. We sort of put a billion and a half into the Birmingham economy, uh, the same when they're in Glasgow. But uh, they're not our games. I mean, they're, if they're our games, we'd probably have banned something a long time ago because we'd be top of the medals table. <laughs> um, Fair enough. But, uh, but I think if that's the premise of the question, then that feels odd because they're, the, they're the Commonwealth Games. Joy? Oh, OK. So I don't know if it's our games. When you say it's our games, um, my thought is that, you know, the original concept of the Commonwealth Games is the Empire Games. So if you look at that word, empire, that spells king, yes. So how does, how does someone achieve an empire? They conquer it. Right. So, and then these games are at the pleasure of the king and... Um, to celebrate the king using all the conquered countries to compete against each other. So, so, I mean, it's interesting, but the Commonwealth has countries in it now that were never part of the British Empire. Togo. I was in uh, Togo a couple of months ago. They joined. 
the Commonwealth because they want to be part of a club of nations bound by friendship and shared values. And nobody is compelled to send a team to the Commonwealth Games. People do because yeah. they enjoy the opportunity to compete internationally it, it, in a game that are labelled invariably the friendly games. Yeah, it has certainly evolved. Rachel, how do you view what we've seen in the, the last week? Well, I think there's nothing better than beating the British at their own game, yeah. frankly. <laughs> um, we do enjoy that here, and, um, and we do it repeatedly at the Commonwealth Games. Um, but I think that, you know, it is a great shame to not have the Games, because obviously there's those athletes who dedicate so much of their lives to competing, and that's a great loss. But the expense at this time in our country is significant. Mm. And, you know, I mean, spending money on affordable housing um, is such an important thing to do. So, certainly in the Territory, where I'm from, we'd love a couple of billion dollars spent on social and affordable housing. So, I can see the reasoning behind it. But, Patrick Gorman, it brings us to the point, why bid for it in the first place, right? Well, um, Joy, I, I represent Perth in the Federal Parliament. Uh, Kate's my next-door neighbour. Uh, Perth hosted the then Empire Games back in 1962. And one of the reasons that countries do bid for these is they leave an amazing infrastructure legacy. I've got Betty Park and the Wacker and other assets in my electorate that are still used to this day. Uh, but to the deeper question about our relationship with the Commonwealth and the United Kingdom, uh, that relationship's evolving. Uh, it has never been set at a point in time. And when it then gets to the question of, uh, right now, there's probably a little bit of tension in the relationship. Some of that's because Australia's better at the cricket. Some of that is tension is because, um, you know, there's been a really difficult decision made by the Victorian government to uh, pull out of hosting the Commonwealth Games. You call it Games. difficult. Was it the wrong decision? Oh, look, these are decisions for states. In yeah, our, but in how our... do you view it? Uh, look, uh, the states bid for these. Yeah. Uh, that they make the decision, that's our federated structure. Mm. Uh, if they make the decision to bid and they make the decision to pull out, I respect that. They're difficult decisions that everyone around the world is making, <coughs> in, in leadership roles, is making really difficult okay. decisions right now. Is that so. fair enough, Barnaby? No, it's not. Um, <laughs> <laughs> first thing is we have to ask the question why there was nothing in the Commonwealth budget about supporting the, uh, the Commonwealth Games in Victoria. Maybe, surely they weren't having little talks about it beforehand. No. No one would ever suggest that, would they? Um, Brisbane cost 1.2 billion. Uh, in in uh, Birmingham, it was 1.6, and this one's six and seven. Sure, there has I been mean, inflation, perhaps oh, not mate, to that not level. That much, PK, for God's sake! I mean, no, perhaps so it's not. Either, but it, it's things do cost more, don't they? Atrocious accounting by the government, or atrocious management by the state Labor government. It's one or the other. And just the way they did it, why didn't they get on the phone to Chris Minns beforehand or to, Tan to, to um, uh, uh, Anastasia Palaget beforehand and say, look, I'm, I'm in a bit of a bind here. I've got a complete botch up. Do you mind doing a couple of events in because Brisbane? A couple of it doesn't sound like they wanted it. Yeah, it sounded like they were taking us for a little bit of a ride, to be quite frank. And, and now Australia looks like a bit of a laughing stock because we've just said we're going to do it, now we're not going to do it. And it also reflects very badly on us, because they say, well, mm. you know, the Aussies, who knows? Just don't take them too seriously. So do you think that the Prime Minister should step in and pay for it? Yeah, well, it should have... It should have something should have happened earlier than this, because the ramifications flow back to the whole of the nation. But now should he step in and pay for them? Uh, he certainly should be working out... He should be calling all the Premiers in and say, can we work this out? Can we get something up and running? We've got Labor in every state on the mainland. Surely we can work together and make this botch up work so that we keep a little bit of dignity because, you know, we've won the Ashes, we're up here and then we blow up the Commonwealth Games and go right back down here again. Mm, and we're going to win the Women's World Cup. Kate, the thing that really worries me is how can we get it so wrong? How can the estimate of the cost go, you know, more than double? And when you look at some of the costs that weren't included in the original estimate, it really doesn't fill you with faith about government's ability to predict the cost of all sorts of other things as well. Um, so so that, that's, that's what worries me, is we actually need to make sure that our public service is able to correctly estimate these things and decisions are made based on facts, not, not what's on politically palatable at the time. OK, so just let me ask this then. Do you agree with Barnaby Joyce that the Prime Minister should be bringing up in all of the Premiers to resolve this? 
Well, I don't actually think it's up to the Commonwealth Government. It, it is something that the states, um, you know, in, independently bid for. And ultimately, I think it's on Victoria to, you know, to have made the decision in the first place and then have to decide how to deal with it now. It would be nice if we could find a solution because I think, unfortunately, it's the athletes who've been looking forward to this who, who end up disappointed. Mm. And this gets us to the topic of our online poll. We're asking you, should the federal government intervene to keep the Commonwealth Games in Australia? You can cast your votes anonymously on the Q&A Facebook, Twitter and YouTube accounts or the ABC News Instagram account. We'll bring you the results a bit later in the show. Now, on a topic making uh, news today, here's Ralph Levy. Thank you, Patricia. My question is directed to Minister Patrick Gorman. <coughs> Minister, what is the process of appointments to a senior government position? And so, Patrick, how do I get a government job that pays in, ex in excess of 900 grand a year? <coughs> and in light of the resignation today of Catherine Campbell, mm. I'm just wondering, could I be considered for a job? Um, <laughs> Patrick Gorman. You'll be really pleased to know that I, as an Assistant Minister, can't appoint you as a Deputy Secretary oh. of a department. Uh, that's one of the things, actually, we're putting some legislation through the Parliament right now to make it really clear that the public service is that ongoing institution, that thing that is there for whether it be a government uh, where Barnaby Joyce is Deputy Prime Minister, a government where Anthony Albanese is Prime Minister, whoever's there, that it is that institution that sustains between governments. Um, so the way that you do it um, is that you maybe consider applying for a graduate position at uh, the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. OK, OK. You go through a competitive... Okay, that's process. not the question. Can I, can I <laughs> say, Patrick, it may be that another path is that you oversee something like robo-debt and then you get moved, you know, from, from really one disaster into AUKUS, where I don't think we can afford to be having a lot of disasters, and get paid nearly a million dollars. Uh, I mean, the, the robo-debt scandal, we, this is going to take a long time for us to recover. We need to reform the public service, mm. but we also have to hold... And, and we need to hold the, the people who are involved in that to account. We also have to hold this government to account mm. to yep. make sure right. that those changes are being made and that it can't happen. But, but on the question of this mm. particular public servant yep. being moved on to this job, was that a mistake? Um, I'm not going to comment on individual public servants, particularly one who... But this, obviously would, we've this public seen. servant is the most high-profile scalp of the robo-debt yeah. scandal. Yeah. Why was she moved on to this really lucrative job? Well, I mean, what is behind that question is you're expecting that we knew where the robo-debt Royal Commission was going to land. And obviously the reason that we started that Royal Commission is because we wanted to get all of the information, allow everyone to put forward their case, and obviously there are some bits which... All of us have seen in the public domain. There are some bits which even I haven't seen in that sealed section. Uh, so that's kind of where we've gotten to. And I wanted to say, like, as a government, though, we did know that there were problems in the public service before we had the RoboDebt Royal Commission. There's a whole bunch of work that was started before okay. that even uh, okay, came out. And um, pay was decided and it was announced before the job description had been written. And that's what FOI has shown. And that is not an appropriate yeah. process. And I go back to what I said earlier, which is when it comes to appointments in the public service, it's not ministers right. who are allocating I get the point. Got... Barnaby Joyce, I'm going to bring you in, because there's a sealed section. Mm -hmm. Everyone wants to know what's in it. Thank um, you, boys. But we know there are other very high-profile people, mm -hmm. including Scott Morrison, who yep. have been condemned by the Royal Commission. Is it appropriate that he stays in Parliament? I think that's a decision for Scott and his electorate. What do I you think? think? I, I think it's a decision for Scott and his electorate. I believe that uh, a person who's a minister, yeah, sure, the executive, you join, you're invited to join the executive, you get kicked out of it, mm. which is, of course, ministers. But actually saying to a person, look, you should, you should be kicked out of Parliament, uh, that, that's taking it to a whole new level because actually that is a decision for the people of Cottesloe Beach, I imagine, and others who actually elected you. You can't... But they can't you... make that decision. Well, they can. It's an election they make that decision. And if, they, be really if they believe... If the... Well, it's not actually. It's probably well, about 18. they didn't know this at the election. But... Uh, sorry? They didn't know this stuff at the election, Yeah, well, it's they? a decision for Scott and for his... for the people in his electorate. Now, I acknowledge that there... that robo-debt 
is wrong and, and people have got to take their medicine and things have got to be worked out so that doesn't happen again. Not for a shadow of a doubt would I say, oh, yeah, just sweep it under the carpet. But I think that um, ultimately... Uh, I, I just know that if you start playing the you should resign from Parliament card, then I'll be saying, oh, Pat, you should resign from Parliament, and we'll all be playing it, and I'll go up to you and say, you know, you should resign from Parliament, and no, no, that's not what it's about. People elect you, uh, and you, it is a con it's not even mentioned okay, in the David Constitution about, about, about political parties. David Littleproud, who's the Nationals leader, yep. your leader, uh, of the party that you're in, mm -hmm. um, is he was pretty strong actually uh, in his comments about Scott Morrison staying on. Well, that's, Do you agree with David Littleproud? Um, well, on, on that, no. Um, well, you know, I think that it's a contract between the uh, electors who elected you, because a lot of them might have maybe they have a different view. Maybe they say, well, why'd you do that for? I, I understood the problems that you've got. I understood the mistakes you made. But, you know, you told me you'd serve for three years. Well, why are you, why are you just going now? OK, so you disagree with David Littleproud, do you think? Yeah, I do. I mean, but that's not unusual. There's a, there's a what else do you disagree with David Littleproud on, then? <laughs> oh, no. You said it's not unusual. How yeah. can I not ask? Well, you said I shouldn't go on this show because it was just <laughs> like, why would you put yourself through it? I don't know. And what did you say? I said, I just get along so well with PK. Yeah. We're just like... And, and that, my friends is the perfect spot to move on <laughs> to our next question from Caroline Dunn. Uh, so it's two weeks now since the RoboJet Royal Commission report was handed down. When will the referrals in the sealed section be released to the public? Because I think we all want to know. Will the government commit to releasing that information within 12 months? Patrick Gorman. Um, I haven't seen that sealed section, so I actually can't answer that question. I mean, I, I, I can imagine that, uh, you know, for many people who've been affected by robo-debt, uh, that's a pretty hard answer to hear, but I haven't seen that section, so I can't give you no, that No, but should answer. it be released no, no, publicly, no. the information in 12 months? Can I help that out there for a bit? There's one of the reasons they don't release it, is if there's the likelihood of a, a criminal case or something going before a court, yeah. people have to be given the capacity to um, go before that court without the pub world of public opinion seeing it first. And that's generally why they seal things up. And that's the last time I'm going to help the Labor Party out tonight. But go back to you. Uh, look, don't, don't, don't lock yourself into anything, Barnaby. <laughs> uh, but, I, look, I would also say on that is that um, yeah, the Commissioner heard everything about this scandal, about the broken lives, the absolute disregard for fellow Australians that was caused by this. Uh, and the Commissioner made a decision to have that sealed section. I respect that decision. OK, you respect uh, it, but would uh, you like to see it? That oh, look, I think everyone in this room and everyone watching this program would like to see it. Uh, that's, I mean, that's... Do you think the government should commit to trying to work to a process uh, where people do see it? Mm. I think we should commit to the process which we committed to, which was we will act on the 57 recommendations we've got. Um, we can't undo the past. I wish we could because it was a scandal and it really hurt people in so many ways. Um, but we will... I can say you want to say something else, so I'm, I'm going to Well, stop. I just think we shouldn't have to wait for 25 years to pass before we see what's in that sealed section. I, I it hope should be more timely than that. <laughs> 25 years, you'd have to agree, James Heapy. It's a long time. Transparency uh, is a oh, huge issue in your country, too, I, in your politics. I am loathe to con comment on, uh, on something that I know so little about. Um, but I... And what is interesting is that uh, this could be any issue in any country where yes. there's a parliamentary democracy. The language is the same. The debate is the same. Um, in the UK at the moment, we've had a run of uh, MPs who have been censured by our sort of standards committee in Parliament. And that in the UK can mean uh, a recall petition. And if over a certain percentage of the electorate dis you sign the petition to recall you, you lose your seat and there is a... There's a by-election or a special election to reselect, um, which seems eminently fair, but there is a thing in the UK Parliament at the moment about whether this Standards Commission has now become so powerful that it's no longer electorates that decide whether MPs serve its this Standards Committee. Mm. So, look, I, I don't want to comment on the specifics of the issue because I don't know anything about it, really, but um, I do think it is interesting that in a parliamentary democracy, our bosses are our electorate. How parliamentarians are held to account by their electorate midterm is a perennial issue, for which I don't think there's any right or wrong answer. Um, but parliamentarians are also people, uh, and if it is the case that there's been criminal proceedings, it seems eminently fair that 
those criminal proceedings might pass without juries having been prejudiced by early publication. Has that seems Boris a very Johnson fair point. been held to account for party go? Well, I mean, given that he is no longer the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom nor a member of Parliament, that would seem to be a pretty severe set of sanctions mm. against whatever happened. Um, yeah. With, I mean, RoboDebt was the most appalling breach of small L liberal values of protecting individuals with half a million people persecuted. And there has to be uh, holding to account on a few fronts. Uh, the individuals involved uh, need to be held to account. Now, we're in a much better position now than we were 18 months ago because we now have an anti-corruption commission. And it's about to start operating, and it will be able to um, it, it has started. It will be able to actually pursue matters of corruption that don't meet a criminal standard, but still are not acceptable. At the same time as that, though, I'm really concerned that we focus on the accounting for the past and we forget about what needs to change to the future. So, so you've got a bill that you want to introduce about transparency. Right? I do. So I'm introducing a private members bill that is part of the work we need to do on integrity, uh, which is about restoring trust. And, um, and that's about restoring trust in our political system and in our politicians and our electoral processes so that we have better transparency, we get the big money out of politics and we level the playing field so there's competition in our political ideas just like there's competition in business. And this is the sort of reform that I think we need to do to start rebuilding that trust so that people can actually believe that the people that they elect are acting in the interests of the country, not in, in their own vested interests. Okay. <laughs> Plenty to get to tonight. Here's our next question from Diane Barker. Hi, thank you. I am continually astounded by the negativity, the fear-based, angry kind of comments, increasingly racist, made by those who support the No campaign. I was mortified by the recent cartoon published in the Australian Financial Review. Uh, isn't Australia mature enough yet to see that in agreeing to have a voice to Parliament, we will be making a step towards achieving a more ethical government model for the future, one that doesn't leave anyone behind. OK. <laughs> now, for anyone who didn't see the cartoon, it was part of an anti-voice ad campaign from Advance Australia. It has been widely condemned as racist, and here it is just for the context of this discussion, <laughs> because I'm sure lots so of people it. haven't actually seen it. Um, I want to start with you, if I can, Rachel. What did you think when you saw the ad? Yeah, I was very shocked, um, similarly to you. Um, I found it highly offensive to Kate and also to Thomas Mayo um, and to Michael Cheney, everyone who was depicted in it. It depicts, particularly from an Indigenous point of view, it depicts Thomas, you know, I, I don't want to say what he's depicted on, on national television because it's an insulting word that we don't use these days. But his torn shorts, the way he's dancing, you know, in this inferior position, it's just got all the hallmarks of an era that has... we have passed by, I would have hoped, in this country. But let me say something on that. And your question, is the nation mature enough? We know that 80% consistently of Indigenous people over years support the concept of the voice. And what they're asking is their fellow Australians to stand with them in this moment. We, we know that Indigenous people have, on so many levels, we politely call it the gap, you know, closing the gap. But that real-life experience for my people, I'm from Central Australia, that real-life experience for our people to have, you know, chronic heart, diabetes, um, mass unemployment, incarceration levels, all of those things, our communities are in crisis. And the Australian ethic is to stand by each other when we are in crisis, you know? And so there's a number of things being asked in terms of our maturity. One, will we stand by the first Australians, the first people, our fellow Australians? Will we do that? Two, will we acknowledge our deep history, you know, which has an English history, you know, it has an Indigenous history, 65,000 years, extraordinary part of our identity, and of course it has the multicultural 
um, element, which has enhanced our nation. So in terms of our maturity, we hope that at this point, which is once in a lifetime generation, I probably will never, I won't live to see this again, will the nation accept our maturing identity and not turn our heads away as we have done in the past from that deep history that is part of all Australians' identity, you know, that maturity of our Indigenous roots. It's something for everyone to share. So, yes, I think our nation can mature. And I think in about 80 days or so, we'll have the opportunity to do so with just a very simple word, and that is yes. Hey, Tony, I just want to bring you in. Um, because that, that question was in, in terms of a specific ad, and you're in that ad. In mm -hmm. fact, you're on your father's knee. Um, you're a grown woman. I imagine that was kind of... Yeah, I don't spend a lot of time on my father's no, knee. No, because you're a grown woman and a politician. A um, I mean, it was offensive, and, and I think it's very sad that, that it came to that. It did, I, I think, mark a turning point, and I believe that it really brought to um, the surface what we're dealing with. Um, it is much easier to spread fear and confusion than it is to spread facts and hope. But ultimately, Australians are a practical people and, and we are fair people. And I think as we get closer to the referendum, people are learning more, they want to understand more, people want to make a change, they want us to be able to develop better policy when it comes to Indigenous issues. We are really bad at it. And if you're not good at developing policy, you get advice from someone who knows better, and the people who know better are those who are affected. So I think we, we will get there, and Australia... I, I'm optimistic that Australians will rise above the, the confusion and fear. OK, you say... Um, <laughs> we're really bad at, at that. Barnaby Joyce, do you agree that we're really bad at doing uh, this? I think that this is probably one of the most divisive things that have has come into my area and regional area in my political history. Who's um, responsible I, for that division? Uh, well, the people who wrote the question, which is the... And it's just, no matter what happens, you're asking a, a range of things. You're asking two people who were born in the same hospital, went to the same primary school, went to the same high school, live in two houses beside one another in a regional town, that one apparently has uh, two ac access to two fields in the federal parliament and one has access to one. And they say, why is that the case? Why are you doing this on... One minute, one minute. See, Let's just see, be respectful. you've got that attitude. When other people out there hear it, they just... It resonates why they're angry about but, but this. But there's not a two spots uh, in the parliament. But if a person's Caucasian or if they're Asian or if they're Indian, they, they're not part of the voice. So there is a difference on race. And a lot of people find that noxious in 2023 that we're bringing back into the constitutional a, a racial clause, number one. Number two is... Uh, the voice, if, if, if... What is it? We haven't seen the legislation. It's advice. Why haven't we seen the legislation? Because what, when would you want to see a contract on a house? After you've purchased it or before you've purchased it? I mean, surely you're entitled to that. The idea that, uh, as a, a group, it's going to have... Uh, it's not, it doesn't have a right of veto, not at all. But what it does have is to, to query the position of consultation, where it says you erred in a decision, you put too much emphasis on a certain area, you, you left out another area completely, therefore you didn't consult properly, and they can take that to the High Court and not veto it, just rule I, I, out as no, null and so, void. No, let me just ask you this question. You say uh, it can have a, a say... Just to be clear, the Constitution allows for specific laws to be made for Aboriginal people, right? certainly does, yep. yep. Section 51, so yep. this is an idea to give them a say in those specific laws, right? Well, the thing about Section... What's in the Constitution now, the Constitution and laws that are brought forward are brought forward by an elected parliament with a mandate from the Australian people. But they can't make special Ma laws for other groups, the Australian can they? People. Sorry? But the... You can't make special laws for other groups like well, you can for Aboriginal people. The, but even those laws, uh, PK, are brought forward by a parliament elected by all Australians. Okay, and therefore Which they will that's not changing. Therefore, therefore, to be. therefore, that will continue therefore, to be the case. But in the consultation process, as it, because it's in the in the 
Because it's a constitutional change, you acknowledge that it has the capacity to go to the High Court. You do that, don't you? But all of the constitutional but, experts no, but say it is right. high return, that's not right. low risk, that's not, Kenneth Payne... Let, let, that's, not right. that's not right. That's not right. And what do, even those people don't say there's no chance, they say it's unlikely. And then Ian Callan says, and of course this is, this is going they to have say, ma major... And he's a former High Court judge as well. Mm. And, and Craven, who's now, uh, I understand, is, is a supporter of the voice, but his, his initial uh, narrative was this is going to create massive... But he's Barnaby, pretty unhappy about the way his words are being used. And yeah, Barnaby, I do they, have they to were... say here that, uh, of course, you can't say it can't go to the High Court because we want the rule of law to apply to everything. We yeah. don't carve things out and say yeah, the well, rule of law rule so doesn't can apply go to, the to that. So it can go but, to the High Court. Well, of course, but anything. judges well, are not in the habit of finding, hey, well, of interpreting legislation okay, I, want to go back. I want to go back to Rachel, if I can, to, um, to deliver. Rachel, some of the arguments Barnaby Joyce is making are some of the arguments that are clearly resonating in the community because if you look at the public polling, um, the no case is gaining traction. There has been a proposition that perhaps just recognition get taken to a referendum and that the voice is legislated. Is that something that you think you could live with? Well, firstly, I mean, I should congratulate Barnaby because he was one of the people who uh, first trotted out the suggestion that this, this would be a third chamber of parliament and that it would um, somehow veto parliament. And then he admitted that he was incorrect about that. And um, I think there's a few other inaccuracies, if I may suggest that in what Barnaby said. Um, firstly, uh, this is not about race. Um, although our constitution has many elements in it, 5126, section 25, it was created by people who deliberately brought race into the constitution. So it's always been there, right? But this is not about giving, you know, Patricia Carver, this is Greek Australian, I'm Aboriginal Australian, you know, this is about <coughs> recognising the deep connection to country of 65,000 years and that matters for something, and that should be in our highest legal document in the land. Recognition of that. It's in the Aotearoa New Zealand constitution. It's in the Canadian constitution. Many other constitutions have this recognition, and the sky has not fallen in. So, to suggest also... <laughs> to, to suggest also that somehow Indigenous people are going to be more privileged um, and that somehow we are going to have an extra vote, uh, that this is going to take away from other Australians, is also just not correct. Parliament will still have parliamentary supremacy, as, as it should. Those elected representatives um, are still the decision makers. All the voice does is give advice. And that mm -hmm. advice can be ignored. And very importantly, when you read the constitutional amendment that is being proposed, it, as you know, Barnaby, it gives the power to government to legislate the detail of the voice, and that is the final part okay. in it, and that is important. You know that you and those other people in Parliament will decide the form Rachel, and the powers of the voice. Rachel, I know it's important. That's why we should see it now. The well, legislation... But we in, should see it in now. referendums, but, but as you know, we in don't referendums... Have it now. I mean, we, Hang on, if you were going to get Barnaby, married, would you want to meet Barnaby, your bride... Sorry. Of, uh, uh, ...or spouse at the altar or on the way out the Excuse door? Me, you Barnaby, want to meet them beforehand. Yeah. What the Australian sure. people are voting on, as you know, is the constitutional change. And that is what we do in referendums. We have a very couple of sentences mm. that we vote on, and that is the right of every Australian, right? But the parliamentarians but, write the legislation. But, that right, is so where the detail will happen. The parliament at this point in time is run by the Labor Party and the, and the, and the Teals in the lower house. The Labor Party, the Greens and the Teals in the upper house. Well, no, you can have, you not, can have enormous no, power in the it's, Senate it's if you not, want to get together with the government. It's not... You know, we're, we, we are... Start with are you we, can we, join the Labor are, Party the in the Senate and the actually have We are the opposition. So this idea that the Parliament's everybody in equivalence, it's not. It's, it's, okay. And what we should be doing... We should definitely be seeing the legislation. So why right. you these people, Let's these pause people this one and I need a quick question of you, Patrick. Why did you legislate it when you had the power to? We put $160 million aside for a referendum. But you didn't do it. No All right, Patrick Gorman, quick question to Diana. you. When's the date? Just when's the date? Come on. Uh, sometime between <laughs> October and December of this year uh, so that 18 million Australians can have a say. OK. And, Diane, if you want the quality of the debate to improve, I'd just say to everyone, actually... Get involved in this. Referendums right. mm. aren't about us arguing. Referendums are about the Australian people having their say. That means getting out there, door knocking, going and having a chat to your neighbours, actually talking about this in the yeah, community. 
and get involved. All right, and having the debate respectfully. Um, <laughs> if you're just joining us, you're watching Q&A with Rachel Perkins, James Heapy, Pat Gorman, Kate Cheney and Barnaby Joyce. Next, a video question from Jane Spire. Will the AUKUS deal go through? And if not, what are our options? Well, James Heapy, there are some headwinds in the US. Will the AUKUS deal go through? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think the, for there to be a bit of dissent in Congress is no, nothing unusual. Um, as you can see from this panel, as you would see from the equivalent panel in the UK, politicians are rarely all of one mind. Uh, Shocking. And exactly, breaking news. Uh, and so you know, a couple of US legislators saying that they've got some reservations doesn't undermine the commitment of the US, UK and Australian government to an extraordinarily important strategic partnership that brings our three countries together around some really important technologies, not just in terms of nuclear propulsion of submarines, but the stuff that will define the battle of tomorrow, hypersonics, cyber, um, electronic warfare, and other things. Um, and you know, we are inescapably in a world that is ever less safe, ever more insecure, and having those capabilities and developing them with your closest friends and allies is a really important part of the response to that insecurity. Mm. There is a US election, though, that's looming, and is there the possibility, if there is, for instance, a Trump presidency, that the deal could be cancelled? Well, the American people are brilliant and sovereign and will choose their president as they wish. Uh, and they are brilliant and sovereign, but does it provide a sovereign risk for us? Well, uh, it, politics always changes. I mean, the, the Australian people are brilliant and sovereign and will resolve the question that is being asked of them in the referendum that we were just mm. discussing. And for, you know, for me to sort of say that the US people can't make a judgment because of what I want them to do is... No, a, no, that's is, not is really nonsense. the question. The question is, do you think that AUKUS would be at risk under a Trump presidency? Well, who knows? I mean, it, it, AUKUS, uh, as an idea, uh, was announced... Uh, under this administration, but it has genuine bipartisan support on the Hill. Uh, it is uh, a very important part of uh, the UK, Australia and the US uh, coming together uh, in the face of a growing challenge in the, in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, and my suspicion is that it would survive a change of administration, even if it was a second Trump presidency. Do you want the job of Defence Secretary? Uh, now ben Wallace is moving on. I, I would love it, but that's a decision <laughs> for the, that's a that's a decision for the Prime Minister, not me. Have you asked? No, you don't ask. These <laughs> don't things. you? <laughs> you Do just... you just sort of look like you really want it? Uh, no, no. In fact, that's the worst thing to do. Is that I think. Part of yeah, yeah. Do I make a good point? I mean, uh, how do you get a job I, I like that? I think he's going to be on the front page of a paper in London tomorrow. That's what I do think. <laughs> that's um, what I'm going for. Yeah. I don't know. It's, if people got the right capabilities, you know, you see people go through Parliament. I've been there for 18 years now, the Senate and the House of Representatives, and you, you can pick talent. When talent arrives, you say that person's going to go all the way. So do you think this guy's going to be the Defence Minister? I only just met him tonight, but um, <laughs> you know, he looks like a wonderful chap. I just got to... <laughs> 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 uh, Patrick too, Gorman, if I could bring you in. Um, seems to be a bit of a discussion looming for the National Conference of the Labor Party around AUKUS, but it doesn't seem like the Prime Minister's really enthusiastic to have that discussion. Why not? Well, firstly, uh, we have a democratic conference you in the do. Labor Party. We open it to the media, the ABC and all the others. Can't wait. Uh, so everyone can do you come want to and have see a robust us be a democratic about AUKUS? political party. Um, already the draft platform we've got out there says that we support AUKUS. Uh, you've seen the Labor Party go to an election, elected on the platform of supporting AUKUS. Uh, we very quickly, when this was put forward, again, you know, negotiated by you know, a Conservative government uh, here in Australia, uh, we supported it. Uh, there will always be some people in Australian society who will have a contrary view. But they're in your uh, party. Yeah. But it's not that... I don't, I don't think that it's the majority of the party, it's I, not the parliamentary party, it's not the, it's not the ministry. They kind of uh, see And you. I'm comfortable uh, winning that debate on the benefits for Australia of AUKUS okay. in any forum, whether that be a community what? forum, whether that be in a party forum, whether that be on this okay. panel tonight. Uh, it's good for Australia. It's a long-term agreement. Ra <laughs> Rachel, I want to bring you in. I mean, I'm, I know that you're very devoted this year to the referendum, but AUKUS is huge. We're spending a lot of money on it. There seems to be 
a lot of opinions about it because of that big expenditure. It's what do you very think big. Of it? Well, can I make television history on Q&A Oh, tonight? how exciting. Yes. yes. I love television I'm history. I'm actually not going to give an opinion on it, <laughs> which has never happened on Q&A, right? <laughs> We're here to give opinions. I'm not going to give one. One, because I don't actually feel qualified to do so, personally. Um, but the other thing I'm going to do is demonstrate how the voice will work. And that is that we are not going to give an opinion necessarily on nuclear submarines. So there you've just seen the demonstration of the voice. OK. Why not? Why not? Why not? Why not? Because it is not the key issue in Aboriginal Australia. I want to give an opinion about renal fa failure, dialysis, how we treat dialysis in Aboriginal communities. I want to give a I want to give an opinion about the housing crisis in Aboriginal communities, about the extreme cost of living. I want to give an opinion about alcohol restrictions in Alice Springs. Those are the things that The Voice will comment on, not, as it's been suggested, nuclear submarines and parking tickets. Um. OK. Next, we'll hear from Holly Key. I was just wondering how dire has writers' job security become to a point where it's necessary for them to strike for a livable wage, and does this reflect Hollywood's toxic values? Well, Rachel, you're the filmmaker on the panel. Yeah, look, it's, we're at a critical juncture, I think, in, in the film and television industry, the screen industry more broadly, and uh, there are many challenges. Um, Streaming services have changed the way the industry works. AI, we don't even know where that's going to go. So um, it is absolutely a crucial time for actors, artists, writers to draw a line in the sand and ask for protections now because the future is unknown. Um, so I support what's happening in the US and people's right to withdraw their labour um, when they feel like potentially they're being, you know, or could potentially be exploited. So. I think it's just part of a global phenomenon, though, isn't it? Mm. Where um, industries are changing, technology is changing, and people are having to protect themselves against those okay. traditional industries. Hmm. Now, I'm going to give you my handheld mic. We've got some mic issue with you that I've just resolved oh, smoothly. Oh. Um, Barnaby <laughs> Joyce, no, you're fine. Your mic's just fine, and you're That's great at projecting too, yeah. you, Barnaby. Uh, <laughs> I could talk on her mic. No, but AI <laughs> is obviously something that is. Yeah. Not just in this industry, but it's yeah, Rachel yeah. raises. It's a I, really I, look, serious issue. Chat GPT is um, really just a, assessing everything that's out there, but GPT four is just something completely different. It's wild. What are you worried about? Um, it's it's sentient. It has capacity to think and. Um, Adds to the adds to answers. Why do you do that? Adds because to I don't think that's true. Well, okay, well, let, let you just finish it and then we'll come to you. Well, yep. and you're at a different angle with Google and a whole range of others who believe it is. It's got it's taken the next step, and I think you've got to be. This is a, a crazy new world we're going into, and I think the the big concerns out there actually it's not so much writers, um, but what about every white collar worker in a in a building that's working behind a keyboard and people thinking, mm. well. Um, if we have, once we have a sort of sentient capacity to artificial intelligence, how do we know when it's actually an accountant or AI or a, or a solicitor or AI or a drafts person or AI and then it actually even goes into the property market? Why do you need high rises if you can do it from the cloud? Yeah, I mean, it, it's definitely, and I, I think there are huge risks um, out of AI. We have no idea the ways it's going to change our world. And what we're seeing with uh, in Hollywood is really the first wave and there will be a lot more to follow. Uh, and there are th huge threats, not just to jobs, but also to polarisation, to truth um, and, and ways that we, we can't even think about yet. The EU has, has taken a pretty strong approach uh, and there's a piece of legislation working its way through there. The US has taken a slightly more voluntary driven approach. Australia needs to respond fast and at the moment we're in a consultation phase, but the speed at which this is happening um, means that it's very difficult, difficult for regulation to keep up with the, the corporations that are, that are developing it for, for their own ends. So it's a huge issue and mm. I think 
parliamentarians. Sounds awfully like, like you're more. agreeing with me. Well, no, but it's just not sentient. <laughs> like you can do um, machine learning, I can go, but it's I can not go, actually I sentient. I don't have time, but I can go yeah. through examples of actually how no, we. You don't have that. the time. That is correct. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but, uh, but it's, uh, I'm all we about, agree. We I'm agree all about the overlapping. Yeah. There is some overlapping agreement there. I saw it, James. If you in your area, obviously in defence, it's a huge issue. It is, and um, the potential is terrifying. Uh, What's terrifying? Well, because I think when you bring algorithms and automation to bear on top of quantum computing, you get to a speed of decision-making and ability to find targets in the vastness of mm -hmm. the ocean and space and sky and in the noise of populations and to process where that target is and connect it with... Um, with an effector, with a weapon, uh, at, at incredible speed. And there's lots of moral questions around humans remaining in the loop. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's why this disruption, the question was about the writer's strike in New York, but others have raised disruption across a whole range of industries and at the most extreme end in war. Uh, and that's why I think it's right that uh, our leaders uh, at the G7, at the G20, uh, have seen that this needs to be something that global governance is applied to, uh, that a rules-based international order needs to quickly evolve to work out how to deal with the opportunities of AI, but also its very real dangers. Uh, and that is something that will be an interesting test for some of the competitors, challenges, challenges around the world who don't always see the world in the way that uh, a wider uh, community does. Um, but it's really important that we do work together internationally to figure out how AI should be, should be governed. It's mm. wonderfully powerful, could be transformative, could solve problems that humans can get nowhere near to solving, and that could be life-saving and brilliant. Yeah. But it could also be catastrophic. Um, the question, though, I, I, like, I think, Holly, you actually asked the question in relation to Hollywood and that yeah. toxic culture, right? It, it's more in question to how long have they been treated so poorly that it's now necessary for them to strike, also coming in with AI, but excluding the AI in this question, like, what's going on and does this reflect Hollywood? And that industry. Is it a toxic um, culture? Well, I'm a bit like Rachel. After I've seen Oppenheimer for three hours, I'm, my concern about um, how hard they're doing it in Hollywood is like zero. Um, yeah, but the, it's, not, it's not the big stars, though, is it? <laughs> um, uh, look, I, I, I just don't... It's the look, people that are doing all the other work. Yeah, I, I just think that if, uh, if, we, if I start focusing on Hollywood, then I'm not focusing on what's happening in Australia. So... I'm just going to kick that one in the long grass and pick it up okay. later on. All right. Fair enough. Um, next, we have a video question from Carolyn Orr. Mr Gorman, I am a medical doctor who lives in your electorate and so is Woodside's headquarters. Western Australia is the only state where emissions are going up and soon Minister Plibersek will have to approve or reject Woodside's Burrup Hub expansion that will enable the company to keep producing dirty fossil fuels for 50 more years until 2070. Will you fight for community members like me and my children or for Woodside shareholders? Um. Okay. <laughs> Very directly a question to you, Patrick Gorman. Uh, I represent and fight for my constituents, uh, the people of Australia, that's what I do. Uh, in terms of the question about the decision that Minister Plibersek has to make, um, there are a range of legal requirements around ministers making those decisions, so I'm not going to preempt her decision or box it in in any way. Um, but you're but representing the, your community. Yeah. The question is, what are you saying? Yeah. Uh, I'm saying we're going through this huge change in Australia, which is we have been an energy exporter for decades. That's been what we've sold to the world. Uh, the nature of what the world wants to buy from us right now is they really do want to buy a range of our energy resources because there's a lot of restriction in that energy market because of a war uh, that has meant that, appropriately, a range of countries are choosing not to buy gas from Russia. I can commend them for that, even though that comes with some very high prices so you think and restrictions. The, you think the deal should go uh, ahead? I recognise that we are going to need gas to get us through to the renewable energy future we want. So you, uh, you myself, as a representative Carolyn, of this community... I'm sorry, I just no, want to nail it no, down. Yeah. ..are going to advocate... 
in terms of your representation for your community, that the deal should go ahead? Um, no, I'm not going to advocate at that level. I'm going to respect the role that the Minister has in making an environmental decision. Do you think the, the deal should go ahead? Uh, I accept that right now Australia is an exporter of energy and we should do what we can to put reliable energy into the international market. Um, and that means that you know, we are a gas exporting country. Okay. Uh, I don't want us to be that forever. I want us it to have like those sounds like you're renewable... saying it's a good idea, but you're sort of sitting on the fence. You represent no, this no, look, community. Um, I do. Uh, Woodside's headquarters, just like Carolyn is in my electorate, Woodside's headquarters yeah. is in so my electorate. So are you with Carolyn? I see. I see the complexity with of this. Um, but I am comfortable if it stacks up on environmental grounds and the Minister chooses to approve it, uh, I'll be comfortable defending that decision. Okay. So 50 years is a really long time. And if this expansion of the Northwest Shelf gas processing facility goes ahead, uh, the, the emissions from the gas that is extracted and then used in, in this facility is the equivalent to Australia's entire emissions budget from 2030 all the way to 2050 when we're at net zero. It is absolutely huge. Yeah, that's good. We know that okay. dem global demand for fossil fuels will dry up at some okay. point. We well, don't know when, but no, 50 years right. is a very long time. Okay, Barnaby? Every, every person here and every person watching this is dressed in clothes and every, that comes in from overseas. Probably drove here in a car that came in from overseas with fuel that came in from overseas, cook on stoves that came from overseas and have a fridge that comes from overseas. Somebody somewhere has to be putting something on the boat and sending it in the other direction. It's called terms of trade. And if you decide that you don't want gas and you don't want coal, then you also wouldn't have got a surplus and you've got to start deciding whether you don't want health, whether you don't want the NDIS, whether you don't want pensions to go up, because it's not magic. This is... I'm an accountant. It's just fundamental. If you don't bring the money in, you can't spend the money. And, so and, and so when... We, and what we have now, an alternative, as we move to the sort of, you know, fossil-free world... In our areas, we're getting run over with transmission lines all over our places. You're turning it to an industrial landscape. In Walker, there'll be more built, there'll be more structures over 260 metres high than in the Sydney CBD, and people think that that is the solution. That is a nightmare. It's our nightmare. If you don't want it in your electorate, why put it in ours? OK. Uh, I really there's that. obviously... There's just one more question I'd like to bring you in, Rachel. There are actually... Uh, uh, um, consequences for Aboriginal communities here too. In this... terms of clean energy or...? <laughs> well, there too, of course. Um, no, this whole development um, also sits on Indigenous land. Is this something The Voice would have a view on? Well, at the moment in Australia, we're going through a process of legislative reform around Indigenous heritage and, you know, we know that um, when, uh, unfortunately, there was the destruction at Jukun Gorge, that has triggered a whole uh, international response and national response to actually say, Indigenous heritage, this deep heritage, is actually of national significance and we need to do more to protect it. And so we are moving towards that space, I think. Um, but there is always um, this issue about, you know, what we've been discussing, you know, Indigenous heritage versus, you know, the dollar benefit you know, that comes to the Australian people and communities. So, and Indigenous people don't shy away from those benefits either. You know, Indigenous mm -hmm. people have many agreements with um, mining companies across Australia and they balance those decisions. But I think what we're moving towards is an Australia that actually does value Indigenous heritage. And we'll see that reflected in the new legislation, I hope, when it goes through Parliament. <laughs> Good to see these people here. And um, we'll see a more mature, a maturing of that value, I think. And we can bring you the result of our online poll now. We asked you, should the federal government intervene to keep the Commonwealth Games in Australia? Uh, more than 3,000 of you responded. Here's how you voted. 18% uh, said yes. 72% said, said no. And I think it's around 10% said you're unsure. Why would you go on a poll to say you're unsure? <laughs> I was wondering that. That is a really good question. Just to say, I, I don't know. Go on. You know I don't what? know. I think, I think we should encourage more doubt, by the yeah. way. I, think, I don't know. I don't know. Um, and to finish tonight's discussion, here's Ryan Nagelski. Thank you, Patricia. With Big W bowing to pressure to remove Yumi Steins' co-authored sex ed book, Welcome to Sex, from sale, 
What will it take for people to exercise their right to shop elsewhere rather than spread hate, hysteria and seed misinformation? Well, Rachel, have you watched the pulling of this book and now it's very popular, popular online? Have yeah, you watched this debate? Well, yes, I have, but I, I want to also make another point, if I may, in response to your question. Like, where do people think that they can just get off abusing staff mm. in, um, you know, frontline workers in supermarkets? Like, and apparently there's been a rise of this since COVID, just abuse to staff. Now, those staff have got nothing to do with what goes on those shelves, but they're subjected to this sort of stuff in supermarkets every day. So, firstly, I find that appalling. Um, I'm a mother of a 13-year-old who may or may not be watching. Hi, son. <laughs> yeah, hi, Adam. Um, Go to bed. But, you know, I think he should have access... Well, it's only 9.30, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I think he should have access to these materials. And I regret the fact that that's been pulled because it sounds like a book that's been based on years of evidence, years of surveys with, you know, young people about what they want to know. And I would actually like that book. And I'm disappointed that because of these actions of people who've accosted people in supermarkets, et cetera, that we're now being denied that and we have to buy it online. I think that's a great shame. And I think the people who've abused those staff, they are the problem. James? It, it depresses me enormously that you, know, you come halfway around the world and you hear the same issues we've got in the UK. And it's not about whether this sex ed book should or should not be sold. It's that we have the incredible good fortune of living in a liberal democracy where free speech and freedom of expression is a right. And yet we have tied ourselves in knots in Australia, in the UK, in the US, in France, in Germany, you name it, by not being tolerant of other people's rights to have a different opinion. And if there's a book on a shelf that you don't agree with, don't buy it. Mm. It seems to me to be a pretty rule, a uh, pretty good rule for everywhere. <laughs> Firstly, uh, let's be honest, teenage kids aren't going into Big W to buy sex ed books. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's the parents walking past thinking, yeah, I've got to have that awkward and difficult conversation with my kid. I'm going to grab this because it might make it that, like, 10% easier. <laughs> uh, so that... And I think what Yumi Steins has done, which is identi identified something that is difficult for a lot of parents, try to give them a tool, because it's not just that some parents just want to leave it to schools, but it's not just a school's job. Uh, and we can't leave it to, like, TikTok and Instagram, which can get pretty R-rated. Mm -hmm. We can't leave it to online pornography, which is not where you want kids to be learning about this stuff. This is just a tool, and um, it's a pretty benign book. Um, and I think there are reasons that people have gotten so whipped up in this. is really unfortunate how we're treating retail staff is completely unacceptable. Um, but if there's some good that comes out of this and that we all realise that maybe we can treat each other a little bit better when we are customers, and maybe some kids get a better sex education, um, I think that's a pretty good outcome from an unfortunate situation. Mm, interesting. Mm. OK. I would just add that I think there's a sweet irony um, about the fact that uh, the efforts to get this book banned have made it the number one yes. bestseller online. <laughs> yeah. Barnaby Joyce, there is a lot of anger about this book. Uh, yeah, look, I haven't, I haven't read it and I probably wouldn't buy it, but it's really it's a decision for the parents, I think, overwhelmingly, whether they want to buy it or not. See, it's a decision the parents can make that choice. What I worry about in politics is where the parents can't make the choice and it comes in over the top of their head. And I think one of the big issues for that lately has been the compulsory acquisition and bulldozing down of Mater Hospital in the ACT, where um, people said, why are you doing this? It's just that the government's view had a different view on the world than that hospital, even though people had a choice to go to another one. I think that's, of all the things that concern me, more than that book, was what happened to Mater Hospital in the ACT. Yeah, that's... that's off topic, but I understand that... No, but I understand that you 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 think that that is actually well, a genuinely important you can't, issue. You can't decide not to, not to be part of it or part of it. The government just does it to you whether you like it or not. Yeah. 
You moved it a whole department, whether people liked it or not. I mean, uh, uh, you know. Uh, well, yeah, that's called decentralisation. And um, people we didn't, didn't we love didn't it. Bulldoze, people didn't love it. We didn't bulldoze didn't turn the department. Out that well, we well uh, this is another part of what the Labor Party does. They sensationalise, come up with massive oh, figures sorry. like Dan Andrew, <laughs> and then use that as their excuse. Use that as their excuse to you, rewind so they can go back and look after the you two did CBSU. Open night, so uh... CBSU. Anyway, it's it's uh, it's not surprising you kicked the inland rail into long grass. You've shut down. You want to uh, centralise again back to Canberra. Um, you've shut down any prospect of building any dams. That's what the Labor Party does. That's how you look after regional Australia. I want to take you back to this don't. book, if I can. <laughs> <laughs> Do you understand, though, why parents might want to buy a book? You know, I, I keep... Because I'm a radio host as well. A lot of parents write in saying, my kids don't want to have these conversations with me. Kids well, don't actually want to have them with their parents. They so. generally don't. They have it with their, their colleagues at school. I mean, I'm... Oh, I'm, the, I'm, I'm how alarming. How, I mean, <laughs> as, a, as a father of six, um, I can basically say, hand on heart, I've never had one of these conversations, but somebody has. <laughs> Do you know who has? <laughs> probably, probably the people at school. I mean, I don't know. You <laughs> need it's, 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 uh, it's, it's, it's to get to the bottom really want to have of either, who's had these conversations <laughs> with our children. We yeah. don't have time to do it, but it's been a delightful conversation with all of you. Thank you. And that's all we have time for. Thanks to our panel, Rachel Perkins, James Heapy, Pat Gorman, Kate Cheney and Barnaby Joyce. Thank you for sharing your stories and your questions. I'll be back with you next week, live from Melbourne, on the panel, writer, actor and comedian Luke McGregor, Finance Minister Katie Gallagher, Liberal Senator, WA Senator Dean Smith, Green Senator for South Australia, Barbara Pocock. Head to the Q&A website to register to be in our audience. Good night. <laughs>